Hello YouTube and welcome to Nafeen. In this world, many strange creatures await you. Unfortunately, the video files were corrupted and we had to make do with the voiceover track. Our first stop is the northernmost country of Wivitana, the land of Wekasi, along the eastern shores of the nation. A few animals from Waivali's tropical waters occasionally wander into the subtropical sea during the summer months. The most easily visible of these are the orange dragon slug, the green seruvagi, the scabbard shark, and the possibility basking shark. The orange dragon slug is a type of nudibranch which has evolved fin-like structures that allow it to swim with grace and precision. As its name implies, it is extremely orange, the color of a mandarin orange to be exact, with a pair of yellow stripes running down its spine, the color of pineapple juice. Measuring it at only 3 inches, or about 8 centimeters long, these sea slugs eat sea anemones, sea jellies, and other cnidarians, and incorporate their stinging cells into their bodies, giving them a nasty sting. Beachgoers must be very careful to look out for these sea slugs. The most easily... Uh, <laughs> Green ceruvagi are a type of six-finned fish. The scales of this fish are the color of kelp with dark brown stripes. They live in kelp forests and arrive during the spring and summer to feed on phytoplankton during one of Nafeen's most spectacular plankton blooms. They arrive in the hundreds of thousands every year to filter feed with their large mouths and baleen-like teeth. While only about a foot or 30 centimeters long each, these plant grazers are a welcome sight for large predators and for the fishermen of Waikasi, who enjoy an incredible bounty each year. Also enjoying the plankton bloom are Migratory Afnaza, a type of small silver-colored six-fin fish. These foot-long fish migrate all over the world chasing plankton blooms and are the most common fish in the seas of Nafeen. Following them are their larger cousins, the bronze-colored Afnatata, which prey on their smaller cousins. Another creature also enjoys the plankton bloom, especially all the krill and small fish that chase it, the Kabidara. An enormous, a stark gray segmented monster with a huge jawless mouth. Over 50 meters or 164 feet long, it moves through the water in one of two ways depending on its circumstances. When it needs to move quickly, it uses its massive finned backside to propel itself through the water. But most of the time, when it's lazing about, it spreads its wing-like fins that it usually ke keeps folded under it to let the current take it away. It filter feeds plankton and fish into its mouth with very powerful suction. Some of the most powerful suction on this planet. This creature is sometimes hunted for its fatty meat. This creature's mating habits are mostly unknown, but it's known that all individuals are intersex. It's believed that these massive creatures breed once every five years and, gi and give live birth to over a hundred young. But one predator that specifically follows the green ceruvagi is the scabbard shark. The scabbard shark is so named because of an old story where a wyvari stuffed a dead shark and used its body as a scabbard for his longsword. While the story's validity is questionable at the best, this meter-long fish is certainly big enough to be used as a scabbard for a typical longsword, and its teeth are conical and perfect for latching onto a prey item and ensuring that they don't escape. Interestingly, the scabbard shark is not a true shark at all, but a bony fish that converged on a similar body plan. It is a close relative of Napoleon fish and other wrasses. The Possibility Basking Shark is a cream-colored native of the Sea of Possibilities hence its name, and spends most of the year filter feeding in the tropical waters of Waivali and the islands of Nofuku. But once a year, at the height of the plankton bloom, these 22 meter or 73 foot long sharks are, unlike the scabbard shark, 
true sharks, and they come here to feed and also to give birth. The female possibility basking shark gives live birth to between one and four pups once a year, with each pup being born at less than one-tenth of their adult size. But thankfully, the plankton bloom ensures the best possible chance of survival for the pups. However, these pups aren't completely safe, for there is a predator native to these waters that will hunt down anything it can catch. Lurking in the gloom is a borsung. Borsung are large carnivorous turtles which have filled a similar niche to large mosasaurs from the Mesozoic era. These enormous navy blue turtles even have light blue bellies for countershading, and they wait patiently for food to come too close, then strike in ambush. Coming in at 14 meters or 46 feet long, they are normally the apex predators of Waikasi's east coast, and they occasionally travel into Waivali's waters as well. They are sometimes called Waikasian dragon turtles. Some are even smart enough to use a little magic to help in their hunts. Borsung only fear bronze dragons, and even then, only ones that are larger than themselves, and also the Mamariba. Once the plankton bloom ends, the Wyvalic species return to the tropics from whence they came, and the region's normal wildlife resumes as usual. One such creature is the Wicosian kelp crab. These crabs are quite small, only 3 centimeters or just under an inch across. These green crabs live in the kelp and feed on various types of plankton, sometimes even devouring the larvae of their own species in times of hardship. Cannibalism is shockingly common among many ty types of animals, but usually only happens when food is scarce. The main predator of these crabs is a six-finned fish called the tevugong. A close relative of the Afnaza, they are believed to share a common ancestor as recent as 10,000 years ago. But this fish doesn't migrate. It prowls the kelp with slow and precise movements, scanning the kelp with its eyes and its keen sense of smell. While no bigger than its globe-trotting cousin, it is green with black stripes and a carnivore. It has a taste for crabs and for sea urchins. Its taste for urchins also helps the kelp forest, since urchins will eat kelp and will destroy the kelp forest if left unchecked. Tevugong are then hunted in turn by skipper sharks. Skipper sharks are another type of false shark, but these are a type of placoderm with a shark-like body plan. Measuring in at 8 meters or about 26 feet long, these placoderms are gray and blind using their keen sense of smell to pin down and devour prey. They gained the name Skipper Shark due to a very interesting behavior observed in their mating season, where males launch out of the water at a very acute angle and see which of them can skip the farthest across the water. This does not completely stop fighting between males, particularly when two or more seem evenly matched. Fights between males are almost always deadly to at least one participant, so these skipping matches are very important to reduce fighting. The females also compete for real estate, but have a much simpler way to prevent fights. Biggest female gets the nest. Fights can happen between females if two are the same size, or if a smaller female wants to try her luck. But these fights are also very deadly. Skipper sharks will also occasionally attack and eat unwary humans and dragon folk. Another important animal here is the Wacosian octopus. Measuring at half a meter or about a foot and a half long, Wacosian octopuses are usually a pale blue color and poisonous to eat. These cephalopods live in small cracks and crevices and will eat small fish and crabs that come their way. Hermit crabs are a particular favorite among these curious creatures, although many opt to carry sea anemones on their backs. The octopuses will usually leave these crabs alone, but some have discovered ways to flip a crab on their back and then attack from there. These octopuses also eat sea urchins on occasion, but it prefers crabs and tevugong. 
Unfortunately for the octopus, there is one animal that seems immune, or at least highly resistant to its toxins. The borsung. While one of these is barely a snack for such a large turtle, a snack is still worth having. Moving on to land, the beaches along the east coast are crawling with Evnod's crabs. Evnod's crab is only 4 inches or 10 centimeters across, but they are prolific scavengers that hunt down fish and other carcasses that litter the beach, and occasionally supplement their diets with washed up seaweed or whatever bits of food are left by beachgoers. These black crabs come out at night, and travel in small groups of one or two big females and their entourage of smaller males. During the day, they bury themselves to avoid being noticed by seagulls. Also buried in the sand are crabbing worms. These worms bury themselves until high tide, and then use their extremely sticky bodies to catch any fish or crab that gets close. They emit a smell that smells just l like a female Elevnard's crab in heat which males find irresistible, provided that they are in the water, and of course, the crabs need water at some point. Female crabs can also get caught this way, as they may mistake the worm for a rival. Of all the creatures on these beaches, none is more despised than the footworm. These half-inch long black parasites uh, remain buried in the sand around the middle tide line. At low tide, they simply stay put. But if anything walks over it during middle or high tide, it launches from its burrow and starts sucking blood and nutrients from unlucky creatures, a process that hurts a lot. Any person who's had one of these parasites cling to their foot will tell you that these creatures are well and truly terrible, especially since they carry diseases such as Serling, Wicassian malaria, Slalga, and Pestros. One creature, however, is a specialist at finding and eating these parasites, as well as their crabbing cousins, the Wacossian sandpecker. These mostly white birds with gray spots perch on beech trees, buildings, and any other solid object they can find when at rest. But once they are ready to roll, they scan the low tide line for holes, and use small rocks to trick footworms out of their burrows. Then pull them out and devour them. They employ similar methods with crabbing worms. They'll also scavenge on dead fish and other morsels if the opportunity arises. The sandpecker is part of a nearly extinct sister taxa to the corvid family that only exists on Nephine, and its intelligence is nearly on par with its corvid cousins. Other members of this family include the Wakasi reed strider, the Kiriho reed strider, and the lesser sandpecker. Life on the beach is no day at the beach, but the East Coast region is far more than just coastlines. Rainstorms turn a fairly large area into seasonal wetlands in the summer, making the forests here into temperate rainforests. Think of it like hurricanes battering the coastlines of the Gulf of Mexico. While there are no major rivers in this region, several ephemeral streams and wadis exist here as well as some permanent swamps. Near the coast is mainly forest, but our next stop is a unique biome. In the northern parts of the east coast, near the border with the northeast coast, is the, the fungal forest. The fungal forest is a bizarre biome of giant mushrooms the size of trees and more fungal Oaths as well. Many of these giant mushrooms also house mosses or other small plants to supplement their energy intake. Each winter, the fruiting bodies shrink away and hibernate, allowing small trees and brushes to plant themselves. Within this wonderland of decomposers, scaled mice are one of the primary herbivores, measuring at 16 centimeters or just over 6 inches long eating seeds, nuts, and various small fungi. Scaled mice aren't mice at all, but a type of modern synapsid reptile with large incisors and crushing teeth that allow it to eat seeds and nuts. These little brown faux mice skitter across the reeking floor of the forest and will bury some of their food in order to save it for winter. Sharing their spaces are rastfin birds. 
These flightless birds eat fruit and small mushrooms and look rather similar to the kakapo in their body shape and size. They will occasionally help scaled mice by eating fruit and leaving them the seeds or by seeking out younger giant mushrooms to eat them together. The partnership between these animals can get so strong that the two species can sometimes be seen looking after each other's young. But not every animal here is a friend. Stanperos lizards are 86 centimeters or almost 3 feet long. These white lizards hide on the stems of giant mushrooms until their prey gets close enough, and then they pounce and sink their venom-filled fangs into their target. These lizards mainly eat rastfin and scaled mice, as well as the smaller Ishir lizard, which has big claws for digging up plant roots. Another type of creature common here are ants, such as the Wacossian dew ant, pesterer ant, bull nest ant, and fungal ant. Wacossian dew ants mainly eat rotting fruits and dead insects such as flies, grubs, and beetles. They are called dew ants due to their farming of honeydew from other insects. The pesterer ant is an ant that hunts actively for protein and defend their nests with very painful stings that can leave faint residual pain for nearly a whole week. Bowl nest ants create pits that other creatures can fall into and then sting their quarry into submission before eating them. They also eat any fruits that happen to fall or roll into their pits. The fungal ants are the most specialized ants, since they act in a manner similar to termites. They burrow into the stems of giant mushrooms and slowly eat the mushrooms from the inside out, killing them over decades. But where there are ants, there are animals that feed on them. Fungal frogs, or zombie frogs, are about 6 to 8 centimeters long and mostly eat ants and beetles. They are pale white and carry special fungal spores that start controlling them as they get older. By the time they're ready to breed, the fungus is completely in control and makes sure that females lay as many eggs as possible and aren't picky about what male fertilizes their eggs. Once the frogs have mated, they live for two weeks protecting their eggs until they hatch starving themselves to death so that their children can eat their dead parents alive and release fungal spores all over the tadpoles. But fungal ants have a special predator as well, the fungus pecker bird. A relative of woodpeckers, they drill into the giant mushroom stems in search of fungal ants and the occasional grub. These birds are no bigger than a hummingbird, and the males are a brilliant purple color. Females are a dark pastel blue color, and will mate for life, so choosing a mate is serious business. Females will choose a male who looks fabulous and whose voice is deeper. He must look and sound his best to attract a mate, and gifts of ant larvae can certainly help the process. Another fascinating type of creature on this biome are flitters. Flitters are small, Ramparinchus-like pterosaurs that eat primarily beetles, dragonflies, fungus peckers, and the occasional scaled mouse. Measuring in at one foot long, flitters are purely carnivorous and very rarely scavenged due to their weak stomachs. They are the fastest flyers in this biome and very rarely fall prey to anything at all. For most of the year, however, the apex predator in this fungal forest is the Calafell dragon. Measuring at 2.4 meters or 8 feet long, this wyvern-like creature is green with lime-colored stripes, pterosaur-like wings, a breath of ice and slush, and a few innate magical abilities. Within the vicinity of the dragon, auditory and visual illusions shimmer in and out of sight and sound, and strange smells can suddenly appear. These dragons primarily use trickery in order to corral their prey into a place where they can chill them to the bone and then eviscerate them. However, during the rainy summers, large crocodilians arrive. These are Wacossian crocodiles, and they are 15 feet or 4.5 meters long. These crocs will devour anything they can ambush, 
and even sometimes managed to catch and kill Calafell dragons on rare occasions. These crocodiles journey up and down the ephemeral streams and wetlands during the summer, and then return to the permanent swamps when the rains slack off. However, their main prey tends to be Rastfen who stop to drink. At least in this biome. Moving back south, there are grasslands near the Wyvalic border and shrublands as well. The, there are also shrublands making up the spaces between the beach and the forests. The southern shrublands are a lovely place to visit despite the rarity of trees, but living there can be dangerous. The main plants are scaff shrubs, the most abundant shrub in Waikasi. These hardy plants have extremely bitter leaves and tough roots that are full of nutrients and antitoxins. During the summer storms, they open their leaves and spread their roots, making a network of roots to gather as much water as possible. Then, during drier winters, they'll drop their leaves and retract their roots to conserve water. These shrubs are 1 to 3 feet tall, though some have grown up to 5 feet tall. Feeding on the leaves of the, the scaff are the caterpillars of the scaff moth. These red 1-inch caterpillars infest the biggest and healthiest bushes and eat the leaves off of them. Each caterpillar will eat up to 10 times its body weight in leaves each day for 2 months, and then form a chrysalis. After another three weeks, the moth emerges with a four-inch wingspan, ready to fly around Waikasi looking for a mate and drinking nectar from flowers as important pollinators with their lavish purple wings which have big, scary eye spots. The caterpillars also mimic the appearance of another kind of caterpillar, a highly toxic one that lives on the leaves and fruit of the edder bush. The Edder Moth Caterpillar is visibly indistinguishable from its imitator, so you have to really pay attention to the plant you find them on. The caterpillar gets its toxins by eating Edder Berries, which contain a poison deadly to most bugs and birds, but completely harmless to most mammals. Dragonfolk who have eaten these have reported having a mild sedative effect. The adult is a large moth easily 3 inches long with an 8 inch wingspan. They have bright orange bodies and a sufficient amount of moth fluff. However, the scaff shrub has guardians that protect its leaves, ensuring that the whole plant doesn't lose all of its leaves. The scaff scorpion. These black scorpions live in the branches of scaff shrubs in small family groups, where they hunt ants, caterpillars, and rodents that try to eat the root of the plant. Whenever a group gets too large, the youngest members will leave and search for a sprouting scaff shrub of their very own. Measuring at 5 inches or about 13 centimeters long, these scorpions are big enough to hunt almost anything in the scaff's microecosystem, including aphids, mealybugs, and even the occasional lethal spider. And working together, they can even take down larger threats, such as the Lareth or the Wakassian long-tailed deer. The Lairith is a foot-long, gray-furred, herbivorous rodent that eats leaves, berries, and the occasional nut. They are immune to the poison of the Edderberry, and they spread the seeds far and wide through their dung. While they are not very large, they are important nonetheless, and like all important herbivores, they have predators. One such predator is the Bellium Python. This snake is 10 feet or about 3 meters long and almost in exclusively hunts lariths for its dinner. It has a mottled scale pattern that allows it to blend in with tall, dry grass and a large, almost shovel-shaped head big enough to swallow a larith whole with ease. Some specimens grow to over 15 feet long, which is about 4.5 meters, making them big enough to challenge larger prey such as the Wacossian long-tailed deer. The wild Wacossian cattle is an 8 foot long muscular bovine, which are difficult for any snake or other predator to wrap around thanks to their great girth, and even harder to swallow. The fact that these cattle are very aggressive also acts as a deterrent. 
These wild bovines are strong enough to uproot entire scaff shrubs. However, they primarily eat grass, which keeps them away from the annoying scaff scorpions and allows them to stay in one place longer than leaf eaters. But even these have predators. The grass crocodile is a 13 foot long crocodilian with long legs that allow it to sprint in short bursts to chase down its favorite prey, the wild Wacossian cow. They prowl in the grass with green and black striped scales that allow them to blend into the grass unseen, and then they leap and bite at prey with a bite strong enough to cause bone fractures. But this area has other grass grazers, like the Wakasi long-tailed deer. Measuring at 6 feet or 1.8 meters long, these are perfect prey for larger belly and pythons. Males of this species, rather than grow large antlers, instead have tusks to intimidate rivals and predators alike. And once they're in rut, they become very irritable and prone to biting. Females tend to pick the male with the biggest and strongest tusks, with a dominant male often having a pick of up to 20 females. During mating season, most male deaths will be fighting other males, but most female deaths will come due to being hunted down by bellium pythons and other predators. One fairly interesting creature is the Hanani. Hanani are brown hedgehog-like herbivores measuring at about 1.3 feet or 39 centimeters long. They are rather shy and prefer not to fight unless they must. They have a painful bite as well as venomous spines that they use for defense. Unfortunately for these creatures, they are also pests. They have a bad habit of ravaging crops, particularly root vegetable crops, and as a result are often hunted by local dragon folk to keep their population in check. Another major predator on these plains is the Stargazer Dragon. Measuring from 12 to 16 feet or 13.6 to 4.9 feet is long. The serpentine dragons resemble lindworms in body shape, but with vestigial wings. These dragons are black with small white spots and have long venom-filled fangs like their sapient cousins. The dragons quietly sneak up on prey, and then make a single strike. The venom travels quickly, and paralyzes prey within minutes. Even Wacossian cattle can only last so long against this venom. Being draconic, it also has innate magic, which mostly manifests as conjured fog clouds, or visual illusions, or even the ability to mimic the sounds of its prey. These dragons, however, are fully nocturnal and sleep in caves during the day. When it is not hunting, it can be seen staring into the, the night sky, often crafting simple illusions as it creates its own constellations. Trees, while rare, are still part of this ecosystem. The most common type of tree here is the Splendorifus. This is a large flowering tree that can hold all kinds of life, from Splendor bromeliads to Acacian squirrels small birds and pterosaurs and other small animals. These trees are sought out by the most impressive herbivore in Wakasi, the Thunderwalker. Thunderwalkers are a type of brachiosaur that migrate from forest to forest and all across the scrublands in small herds. They devour leaves and fruit within their paths. The star-shaped leaves of Splendorifus are seemingly a favorite of these giants as they will sometimes strip whole trees bare. Measuring an average of 89 feet or 27 centimeters long, the Thunderwalker uses its crest to bellow loudly at others of its kind for communication, and they will also use them to intimidate attackers. Even a Stargazer Dragon will often think twice before attacking even a sleeping Thunderwalker. Rather amusingly, the calls of these creatures sound very similar to a didgeridoo. Burrowing under the ground are Rakosian burrowing rats, which mainly eat beetles and other bugs, filling a niche like meerkats. They are only four inches long each, fully grown, 
and enjoy the open spaces where they can watch for predators. They are mostly tan, with dark brown stripes and white spots. These rats can also eat plant roots and occasionally ingest clay to neutralize poisons. They are mostly hunted by a specific predator. The Dusky Runner, a type of dromaeosaur. They hunt small mammals and also scavenge frequently. These blue feathered dinosaurs measure three feet or about a meter long, and they use their claws to help dig up rat burrows. They also have a unique adaptation among dinosaurs. They and their entire genus can pronate their wrists, something very few if any other dinosaurs can do. However, they prefer to wait and catch the rats in the open instead of digging for them if they can. After all, conservation of energy is essential in the game of life. If they cannot catch a rat, they will sometimes instead grab and eat scaff scorpions. When the summer rainstorms roll in, many animals seek higher ground. The seasonal flooding brings with it Wacosian crocodiles and several kinds of fish. The scaff scorpion, however, remains firmly within its shrub. They never lost the ability to absorb oxygen through their skin, and thus can still breathe underwater just fine, provided it's oxygenated. However, this leaves their young vulnerable to being eaten by fish, such as the timper and the kip. During this time, the adults become extra aggressive, often stinging anything that gets too close. Much like in the fungal forest, the Wacosian crocodile is king of these temporary waterways, but here, the dragons are bigger and venomous. Both animals respect each other's territory and steer clear of each other in a state of mutual fear. Stargazer dragons can kill a crocodile that strays onto land for too long, and a small float of crocodiles can team up on a stargazer that goes too far into the water. So, the crocodiles rest on islands where the dragon cannot reach without crossing water, and the dragon only goes to the water to drink. The forests of Waikasi are brimming with life. From many kinds of plants, to insects, to all kinds of reptiles, mammals, birds, and a few odd arthropods, there are also dragons. Very little surprise there. There are mighty oak trees, succulent maple trees, magnolia trees, pecan trees, and many fruit trees in these deciduous forests, as well as shrubs and grasses aplenty. Ferns also take up a lot of space. Among the trees, the most alien is the curdidum. This is one of Nafine's infamous blue-leaf plants, all of which are at least partially carnivorous. The curdidum grows special sacs along its base, as well as sweet-smelling curdidum nuts during the summer storms, which attract fish towards the sacs, which then close up around them and digest them. Their actual seeds drop in the late autumn and bury themselves until spring. Common herbivores include the Wakasi long-tailed deer, the kawanu, monkeys, and several species of fruit bats. Kawanu are dark-furred sloths that eat the leaves off of trees. Unlike three-toed sloths, these are quite active and agile, with long arms allowing them to swing from tree to tree like monkeys. Most of the monkeys here look like barberry macaques, but a bit more orange. They mostly eat fruit and seeds, staying out of the way of the kawanu. Leafcutter ants, dew ants, and thorny ants make their homes in the forest as well. Thorny ants are red ants with thorny bodies, which make them tougher for many animals to eat. The thorny ant is a scavenger feasting on dead beetles, worms, and other arthropods. Also skittering on the forest floor is the four-foot-long armored millipede known as Vronx millipede. They eat rotting leaves and fruit and have very strong exoskeletons. The skies here are home to dragonflies, damselflies, cipher beaks, songbirds, and various small pterosaurs, as well as Favre's dracohawk. Cypher beaks are eagle-sized predators, which eat other birds and carrion. 
They can also imitate noises like parrots, and can even mix and match noises, hence the name Cypherbeak. Favara's Dracohawk is a three-foot-long creature that migrates between Wivitana's subtropical north and south, chasing the warmth of summer and flocks of migratory birds which are its primary prey. Draco hawks will also sometimes stop briefly in the tropics to eat snakes, small mammals, and larger insects. It is named for Favara, an ancient hero who tamed 20 Draco hawks to be his own personal army. The Draco hawk is a mostly dull green color and has four wings marked with eye spots to freak out potential predators, along with a pair of small talons on its backmost legs to hold down prey. Their mouths can deliver a painful bite, and they can also expel a breath of hot plasma that comes out in a rapidly dispersing cone. They typically use this to kill and partially cook their prey, using it sparingly since it can take several minutes for it to be usable again. Much like true dragons, the Draco Hawk is innately magical. This magic manifests by giving the dragon something it needs in the moment, mostly manifesting as a defense mechanism. However, some smarter Draco Hawks have learned to use this magic in their hunting. Most of these are older specimens. And when they get older, they be become something known as Greater Draco Hawks. When a Favara's Draco Hawk lives for at least 20 years, it undergoes a period of rapid growth and becomes a Greater Draco Hawk. Almost double the size of their smaller relatives, the Greater Draco Hawk is usually unable to breed, but is a much more potent and intelligent user of magic, often using it to aid in hunts as well as defense. While rare, a Greater Draco Hawk will occasionally attack dragonfolk or humanoids and some even develop a taste for them, at which point they become extremely dangerous. However, Draco Hawks are considered a pest at worst, and most of them seem oddly aware that attacking dragon folk and humanoids is a very bad idea. Every now and then, the warbling calls of the Thunderwalker will resonate at the edge of the forest. Thunderwalkers stick to the outer forests most of the time, but if they are desperate enough, they will use their weight to topple trees and go deeper into the forest. Adults are off the menu for any creature aside from green dragons, but their babies, no more than four feet long, are easy pickings if you can sneak past their mother and father. Another carnivorous creature is the Mushakmu. Found in many forests, they have pretty flowers growing on their cephalopod-like bodies to lure in unsuspecting prey. Once they lure them in, they use their eight thorny arms to bludgeon its prey, and once the enemy is softened up, it uses its briar-like tongue to strip them of flesh, bit by bit, painfully eating them alive. Its flowers can also lob balls of acid at long range. It is a truly deadly creature for anyone unprepared to deal with. They are said to prefer the flesh of young children. Their gelatinous bodies are also quite muscular with layers of fat. This allows them to soften blunt force attacks against them, since it acts as cushioning. Measuring in at about 10 feet across, they are, are very deadly and not something anyone would want to deal with. While these are more common elsewhere, namely the Heartland region, a few packs of Balpisco Hounds can be seen and heard in these forests. The Balpisco Hound is a boxer-sized, mostly black-furred canine adapted to the life of an omnivore. The beast mainly eats fruits and nuts, but it has adaptations for eating fermented fruit and seems to thoroughly enjoy any alcohol given to it. Balpisco hounds are very clever and will beg for food or alcohol from most humanoids and dragon folk they see. If nothing is given, they will often follow them for miles on end and steal any food they can. They are considered a minor pest and will only attack if provoked. While being the size of a boxer, these dogs look a bit more like Dobermans in the face. Our penultimate stop is the swamps. 
These are the true homes of the Wacostian crocodile, many types of fish, and many unique insects, as well as a very special cat. A few black dragons occasionally make a home in these swamps and become apex predators there by default. In these swamps, water beetles and freshwater mussels are the primary herbivores, eating various water plants and algae respectively. These beetles are only 6 inches or about 15 centimeters long, making them gigantic by beetle standards, but they are a perfect meal for the Wacossian bayou frog. At around a foot or 31 centimeters long, these frogs are fairly large and very noisy, with a special love for the beetles of the bog. The freshwater mussels are hunted mainly by freshwater octopus. At one and a half feet or 40 centimeters long, these cephalopods have a very sharp beak and enjoy the benefits of hiding in reeds and hemlock. They also occasionally eat the beetles or even the frogs, but they tend to specialize on the mussels, being the only creature that can reliably open them. Freshwater snails also live here, and grow up to five inches long eating the waste products of other animals, and excreting a slime that helps various water plants grow faster, making this snail a very important part of the ecosystem, especially in the driest parts of the year when water holes can start becoming more and more toxic. The octopuses will also eat the snails, but only if their population outnumbers the mussel population. The most mysterious creature of these waters is the freshwater trilobite. They are omnivorous, able to eat water plants as well as leaf litter, insects, and carrion. They are rare and have never been seen mating, but they are also quite skittish and tend to flee if approached. This makes researching these ancient creatures a real difficulty. What we do know is that the Wacossian crocodiles love these foot-long snacks. Mosquitoes also breed in these waters, and they are preyed on by dragonflies and Wacossian bayou frogs, and their larvae are an excellent food source for the weka minnow. These small six-fin fish eat insect larvae and measure only half an inch long on average, making them perfect bait for the larger Sorfini catfish. Measuring two feet long, these fish and the freshwater octopus are the Wacossian crocodile's main source of food for most of the year, and these catfish are also a favorite food source for another predator. The Reed Stalker. The Reed Stalker is a 1.5 foot long mud brown feline known to stalk in Wacossi's wetlands and swamps. While related to the Hiuha of northeastern forests, it is the last known member of its genus. The reason for its rarity is because of a rumor about these cats attacking unattended children, which became popular and led to a crusade against all of the cats in the genera. The reed stalker barely managed to survive the event, but faces extinction due to inbreeding in the near future. It hunts fish as well as small birds in the wetlands during the autumn and winter months when, fr when rain is scarce, and then takes the higher ground in spring and summer to hunt mice and large insects in the muddied grasslands. When these cats eventually die out, the bird population of the wetlands is expected to skyrocket, since no other swamp animal specifically hunts birds. The largest fish in these waters is the Corsair catfish, a bigger relative of the Sorfini catfish. These can grow up to 6 feet or 2.8 meters long and eat smaller fish as well as freshwater trilobites and baby crocodiles, making them the primary limiter on the Wacossian crocodile population. These catfish are fairly uncommon, but won't hesitate to attack humanoids or dragon folk in its territory. During droughts, many fish will hibernate in mud shoals, including both types of catfish, but in an ordinary year, the water simply becomes crowded and full of dung for the snails to eat. Once the summer storms or other floods come in, 
The swamps expand and pour over into ephemeral streams, allowing most of these creatures to explore new areas and eat new kinds of food. The Sorfeni catfish had even picked up the habit of eating fruits that fall into the water out of trees, and many freshwater fish, such as the weka minnow, also eat any ants unlucky enough to have been caught in the running water. Our final stop is Mount Ashal, the only true mountain in this region. The mountain has a few unique species, but is a very important part of the whole region. The mountain's outer layer is rich in clay and limestone, meaning that as it erodes, it is constantly neutralizing acids and enriching soils, while its inner layers are full of andesite rock and an inner core of gneiss. The lower parts of the mountain are rich with vegetation, forming a thick jungle-like canopy of apple, cherry, and wagnes trees. The wagnes tree is a fruit-bearing tree native to this mountain, and the fruit tree that exists at the highest altitude. These trees bear purple fruits with a bittersweet taste and a minty aftertaste that humanoids adore. These fruits can freeze over in the winter, becoming a frozen treat for any who find them. Grazing on the grasses higher up the mountain are Ashal sheep. These two meter long sheep have gray wool, big horns, and a territorial attitude that keeps them from domestication. They spend the winters huddling and hibernating in caves, and spend spring looking for mates. Both males and females fight their peers for the right to mate, ensuring that all mating pairs are strong and capable, or in some cases, very clever. A female will have up to seven lambs in a litter, though only two or three are likely to survive the first year. A male and female will typically stay together for six years and raise three litters together before they split up to see other sheep. The fruits of this mountain are prime feeding for the fruit bats, which migrate here each autumn to partake of the many fruits before returning to the tropics to eat more fruits. But while they are here, an even bigger bat comes out at night to eat them. The dire bat. These seven foot or two meter long bats are huge and eat bugs and small birds as well as smaller bats and cave fish. These dire bats are too heavy to truly fly, and must walk, climb, or glide to reach their food. But they also have a secret weapon. A sonic screech that can cause organs to rupture at close range, and stun enemies at mid-range. Even at long range, this shriek can deafen or at least terrify enemies. Looking in the caves... One might spite a Gartis if they are lucky. Gartis are subterranean lobsters the size of a person. Highly aggressive, their shells are covered in various crystals that have weak magical properties. Particularly old specimens of this species can even cast spells from these crystals and create layers that bend to their will. Gartis collect gems and other shiny objects and hoard them as part of their mating ritual. The crystals on a Gartis back can be used as spell casting components. The Gartis's diet is believed to consist of subterranean fungi. The Ashal Great Hawk is a carrion bird measuring 2 feet or 61 centimeters long with a nearly 1.8 meter or 6 foot wingspan. These hawks have keen eyes, keen smell, and are believed by some to bring bad luck. These hawks live in and around the mountain as its primary scavengers and are territorial. But if you want a real predator, look no further than the cliff claw. The cliff claw is a 4 foot or 1.2 meter tall white dromaeosaur with thick feathers that hunt in packs to take down a shawl sheep. They also attack from above and sink their serrated sickle claws into their victims, bringing them down slowly. 
Cliff Claws tend to be led by a dominant male and female leading small packs of their children. Once the children come of age, they are typically kicked out of the pack to fend for themselves, being led by the best hunter until they can find mates of their own. At the summit of Mount Ashal, there layers a silver dragon named Ushua. Ushua mostly eats sheep, but occasionally dips into the forests nearby to eat long-tailed deer. Ushua awaits atop Pale Ashal, above the snow line, beyond the reach of sheep, of dire bats, and of cliff claws. He waits for the day that a worthy adventurer party comes to greet him. Many have tried. Only three groups are known to have succeeded. The Silver King atop the White Mountain awaits the brave, the bold, and the strong. And it is here that we end this journey into Wakasi's East Coast region. If this video gets enough views, then I'll do another one in the neighboring region. See you guys next time. Bye! Just kidding. First we have to do bloopers. Lol. Remember that's going in the blooper reel. Beachgoers must be very careful to watch for this colorful sleece or otherwise create their own safety areas with finely woven and large safety nets and buoys. Also enjoying the plankton and bloom are the mag <laughs> using their keen senses of smell and hearing to pin down and devour play. Play? Dang it. Of all creatures on these beasts, Thieve ha Thieve? Oh my goodness, I cannot talk today. In the northern and parts of this east of the But not any Dang it. After another three weeks, the moth emerges with a four foot foot not four foot, dang it. Then, like all impertinent, impertinent. Hanani are brown hedge like. <laughs> it can be staring. Dang it. So close. Adults are completely off the menu for any carnivore outside of a dream. <laughs> dream? Ah. And seems to theory. A few black dragons occasionally make a home in these swamps and become apex predators there by def Oh gosh darn it. Stupid phone! And this is the real end of the video. I'll see you all next time. Hope you enjoyed the outtakes. Buh bye bye